ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time for What Do You Call It Podcast! Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of What Do You Call It Podcast. I'm your host, GB, and today's guest is not only an ECW original, he's everybody's favourite homeboy and a war hero. What are we talking about? It's Chili Willie. How are you doing today, mate? You okay? Yeah, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me on, man. It's, it's, it's a pleasure. It's an honour. You know what I'm saying? Um, so glad to be here. Honestly, thank you for coming on, mate. Um, we've been talking a bit on, on uh, the old... DMs and uh, actually having a good conversation so it's going to be a fun episode also for the listeners out there there might be a slight delay but we're going to work through it but it will not stop you from enjoying this episode so one thing I have to ask exactly. to kickstart this show is how did you come up with your ring name Chili Willy I have to know <laughs> well when, when I started back in 1997 I started out and uh, CW Anderson was my my trainer at the time and I wanted to go by the name of Cyrus the Virus after the movie Con Air. Oh. But then I found out that uh, there was a Cyrus there already. Actually, you know, uh, Don Kaus in uh, AEW now. So he was there. So one of my friends at the time, my, my girlfriend, her brother-in-law, I called her on the phone one night. And he said, uh, he said, yo, Chill Will is on the phone. And so it just kind of stuck Chill Will. And then I just put the Y on it, you know what I mean? The Chili Willie mm. on both of them. And I said, oh, I, I, so the next time I went back to practice, it was like, yo, I think I came up with a name. They said, Chili Willie. I said, Chili Willie. They said, yeah. They said, Chili Willie, that's like the penguin, right? That's the penguin, you know, the little penguin shit. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, but, you know, I'm going to have a little twist or whatever. So, you know, you just, uh, it just stuck, you know what I mean? Chili Willie, you know, it, it was Chili Willie, the ghetto superstar. Yeah, I was I was uh I was coming out as the ghetto superstar, and I was coming out to the song ghetto superstar, and then uh, when I got invited to go up to ECW, I kind of changed the theme a little bit. Ah, uh, wicked man! It's such a unique name. I love it. I didn't know at first until I was a lot <laughs> older that it was actually based on like a little cartoon oh. character or something. So I didn't I didn't have a clue. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to kickstart the episode because for about over 20 years, I've just like, Chili Willy, such a great name. And then you had your tag team partner, Balls Mahoney. But we will be talking about that. We'll be talking about yeah. your ECW career. But just before we talk about your ECW career, wow. um, I want to know, did you actually grow up watching wrestling? And if so, who were some of your favorites? Oh, yeah, man, I did. Since I was about seven or eight, you know, watching the WWF. Watching NWA, Georgia, Texas wrestling, the Florida wrestling, all that. So, uh, but my favorite, uh, I have to say, is Ric Flair. Uh, but there was there was there were many other ones, you know. Of course, you know Rocky Johnson, mm. um, Tony Atlas, as tag team, St. Jones, Pedro Morales, you know Bob Backlund, uh, Ricky Steamboat. <laughs> I mean, this goes on, you know, the Road Warriors, you know. Yeah, man. So uh, I had a, I had a <laughs> lot of, uh, I had a lot of uh, favorites to, uh, when it came to pro wrestling, and uh, it was just something I wanted to do, man. It was like uh, they were like my real superheroes, you know. I mean, you mm. watch cartoons and you watch movies, but it was like seeing these guys come in and fight, you know. And it was like, oh man, you know. And and I used to be picked on when I was a little kid because I was I was very small, but. Uh, when I turned like 13, 14, I started lifting weights and mm. I really, I really wanted to get into the pro wrestling, you know what I mean? And so, uh, it was one of those things cause I believed it, you know, I believed in it. Mm. You couldn't tell me, you could not tell me that that wasn't real. You mm. know what I mean? You couldn't tell me that shit was not real. So you ask anybody, my, my school friend, uh, childhood friends, you know, I always wanted to be a wrestler. And so not everyone wanted to live, you know, not everyone Shall I say, uh, live their dreams, but I live mine. So, um, you know, hey, I, I can't, I couldn't ask for more. You know what I mean? We're going to talk about the dreams that you would achieve. Uh, I want to ask as well, where is it that you actually would train and what inspired you? Well, I think you actually just answered that. What inspired you to become pro wrestler? So eliminate that part. But where is it that you would go to train and how did you discover the wrestling school? 
Yeah, man. It was um. Ooh, let me see. I got my 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 first marriage. I got married in 1989. Show you how old I am. And so. Uh, <laughs> The first time that I, I stepped into a wrestling ring uh, was in Paulsboro, New Jersey, at the Larry Sharp School Monster Factory. Oh, okay. Um, I just, I went there. Yeah, I went there, tried out. It was on a Tuesday night. i never forget it. I was so nervous, man. I had a singlet, a brand new singlet that I bought. I put it on backwards. Uh, that's how nervous <laughs> I was. Um, I didn't have the money. <laughs> so uh, I, went back, I went back to work. And it wasn't until 1997 that I actually, no, I'm sorry, 1996, I tried out for the WCW power plant oh, really? down in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, I, play, I, I tried out for that um, 1996. Uh, Buddy Lee Parker was the uh, trainer there. Uh, you, got, you had guys like Hardbody Harrison there and all those guys. Well, it was like 30 people there, 30, 30 men. You know, you had former uh, football players, you know, college guys, whatever. I was one of the three guys who survived that four days. It was like four days of training. And mm. uh, at the end of at the end of uh, making it to the power plant, you know, you go and you talk to Jody Hamilton, uh, Mr. Wrestler number two or one, I think, whatever, whichever one he was. And so, uh, forgive me if I get it wrong, but I didn't have the money. It was like three thousand, four thousand to go to school. And so I went back to North Carolina and, um, you know, then that's when I, I went to my old high school and they had a, they had a, uh, indie wrestling show and you had guys like Steve Carino, Joey Matthews, CW Anderson at the time, Lodi, I think I want, I think he was there. Um, Shane Helms, a lot of those guys was, was, were, they were wrestling at my old high school. Well, mm. my dad was working at the high school. So I got in, I snuck in. To the back, you know, and uh, I caught I caught the show, and lo and behold, the the guy that was doing the the sound system is C.W. Anderson cousin. His name was Dan. His name is Dan Wright. Hmm. Uh, he still runs a school in uh, in in Southern North Carolina, and so I went I went to him doing intermission. And I asked about how could I, you know, get into wrestling, and he gave me the number, and we. I went to their practice, man. It was only like three or four guys. Uh, there's a guy named Laz, and then there was another guy named Stacy Jones. Um, so it was just the three of us that CW was training at the time. And uh, before he went to ECW, and then when he went to ECW, um, he pushed us off to another guy named Gary Simone, who's all he, he was also a worker. Uh, and so I have to credit those three men, Dan Wright. Chris Wright, which is C.W. Anderson, and Gary Simone. Those are the three instrumental people who got me into wrestling. Oh, sweet, man. And he also worked for the Hardy Boys, Omega Wrestling. I just want to know what the Hardy Boys like. Well, like I said, um, I was I was in that circuit because it was in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They were like in the western part. I want to say the western part of North Carolina, Cameron, North Carolina. Um, I worked for them once. Um, oh, okay. At, it was at a, like a county fair. Yeah, guys like uh, young guys like at the time Caprice Coleman, uh, like I said, Shane Helms, Shannon Moore, Joey Abs, and so it wasn't until later on, like ninety seven ish, ninety eight, um, that I was really, I I was not working for Omega, but I would be on some of the some of the cards that these guys were on. Oh, and okay. So, so it's um, combined then, yeah. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was fantastic, man. I mean, but those guys, you know, the Hardy, Matt, and Jeff, at that time, they were they were doing dark matches for WWE at the time, and so uh, they were, you know, in and out around the North Carolina scene. Joey Abs, who already went up. Um, I don't know if you remember the group Main Street oh, Posse. Man, what is the name of that group? They used to be with Steph. Yes. Yeah, you know. I love them, man. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Joey was one of them. Well, he used to be Venom. And then, you know, at that time, uh, Lodi, he had went to WCW mm -hmm. doing with the uh, Ravens flock. And so usually, I mean, around the, the North Carolina scene, it was just like guys who were left there. Shane Helms at the time was, was, was pretty much left there. Um, Shannon Moore was kind of in and out. And then... ECW was like kind of coming in or whatever. They were doing their thing up in the north. I didn't know anything about ECW. And 
Mm. CW went there. And at that time, um, him and Steve Carino, they were getting their push there at ECW. And um, I was just, you know, I was just doing my thing on the indies, you know what I mean? And so uh, I, I knew nothing about ECW. <laughs> I just knew WCW <laughs> and WWE or WWF at the time. And so that was my main concern. But uh, I got invited to go up to ECW with, with Steve Carino and uh, C.W. Anderson. And the rest is history, you know what I mean? Just before we do talk about you debuting in ECW and your career there, I want to ask, you competed in a number of strength competitions. I'm not an athletic guy, by the way, mm -hmm. but I'm sure the listeners will want to know. Uh, <laughs> what's the most that you did lift? And where would you normally rank in these competitions? Deadlift? Oh, no, 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 no. I wasn't... Mm -mm, no... I did tough man competition. That's I didn't do weightlifting oh, competition. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I only did I only did weightlifting competition in high school. Was I wasn't very strong. I mean, I was strong enough, but I wasn't that strong. But <laughs> but um, when, when I was doing indie wrestling, the the tough man competition would come through my town or come through certain parts of North Carolina, and you know, I, w I was like trying to get some money. You know what I mean? Some extra cash. I was hustling. You know what I mean? So. I said, you know, I'll try it, you know. And so I, I I, think I had about five of those fights. Four of them I know were, were straight legit because the one that I fought, the first one was like at a boys and girls club or something. Mm -hmm. But I won every single one. And so, um, you know, that was real fun. You know, that it was it was fun, but uh, I was like, yo, boxing is no joke. You know what I mean? It's, I mean, wrestling is no joke neither. But, yo, getting hit. And uh, <laughs> and, and, and just seeing black, <laughs> mm. and then coming back, and it's like, whoa, you know, you gotta, I mean, you really gotta be able to move, you know. It's it's no it's no joke, you know what I mean. So um, it's not like you're fighting in the street, you know. What I mean, you're fighting in the street, you can grab somebody, you can take it down. But boxing is like, I mean, you just boom, you just see something coming, and if you don't move, you don't have that head movement, man. Mm -hmm. Even in just even just in like a amateur. You know, tough man competition. You know, I was getting my ass kicked one night. One night, I, I was really getting my ass kicked. And luckily, uh, I hit the guy with an uppercut and knocked his mouthpiece out. And that's how I won. God the hell. <laughs> bone Crusher <laughs> Smith. Yeah, Bone Crusher Smith, the champion. Bone Crusher Smith, he was a judge at that, 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 uh, at that fight. And I won that fight. It was at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, home, home of the Marines. And here I am walking in the, in, in the arena with blonde hair. So all the Marines are like fans, and they're like, boo, boo, who is this guy? I got a, I got a, I got a Chili Willie t-shirt on. And they're like, who the hell is this guy? You know? So, so, so they were rooting for me to get my ass kicked anyway. You know what I mean? I walked yeah. in with blonde hair, and they're like, no. Kick so, his uh, ass the, <laughs> Yeah, the dude, and the dude that I fought. So the dude that I fought really, I thought really kicked my ass. You know, I was, I was about to, you know, uh, kneel down and say forget it. Yeah. But luckily, I just hit him one time, and his mouthpiece came out. I was like, whoo, thank God. I was like, well, but I didn't think I still didn't think I won. You know, what I mean, I just yeah. thought, you know, hey. But you know, you fight, you fight, you keep fighting until you lose, and it's a two, it's a two night event, yo, and. I was like, yo, I was gassed out. But the next night, you know, it was easy, you know, because all the big guys are already got their ass kicked, you know. <laughs> so, mm. so you know, the next night it was like little guys. I'm just sitting there, oh, oh, you know. So, but yeah, it was fun, you know. That was um, that that was one of the things I did. If if it came around and I wasn't wrestling, that's wicked, man. I'm so glad to learn something that late. And also, where were you for the brawl for all <laughs> tournament, mate? You would have done pretty well. Can imagine you against Bart Gunn, just like. <laughs> no doubt it's like it's like when i see boxing now you know like i see those guys those, those logan guys that now uh, i'm like good for them they're making their money you know yeah. i'm like make they, they making their money you know i can't i can't knock their hustle you know what i mean but oh yeah uh, yeah I, I admire them it, it, but, it, but it's but it's definitely bullshit until they fight some real boxers you know what i mean oh, <laughs> besides yeah. mayweather you know, oh yeah, mate. But so, he, you know, but he's in it for the money. He doesn't care about what the fans. Of think. course, of course, <laughs> of course. He, hey, hey, he's a smart cookie, man. I gotta give it to him too. You know Definitely. what I mean? I don't. I, I at first I was like, no, nah, man, don't do that. You know, you kill him boxing. If you're gonna box, box. If you're not, you know, stay retired. But I understand. You know, if you, if you keep making money, keep making it. You know what I mean? So 
I get yeah. it like that. I, I've, heard, <laughs> I've heard him from the business point of view, but in terms of an actual right, boxer, right. I don't really care for him anymore. But, um, right, well, exactly. Wiki. So I'd like to now <laughs> jump uh, on the old ECW, Extreme Championship Wrestling. Nice. For anyone that doesn't know what the letters stand for, I'm sure they will. Mm -hmm. And you would go on to make your debut in 2000. Uh, that's correct. As Taz once said, yes. at the ECW locker room, it was the island of the Misfit Toys. I want to hear from you, someone who was there. What was your first impressions uh, of ECW uh, like? And it's not a family show either, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> Yo, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, man. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know anything. Like I said earlier, I didn't know anything mm. about ECW because I couldn't get it on television. Um, where I was living. So I, I had no idea. I think it was called East Coast Wrestling or something at the time. And so when I got there, I went, like I said, I went to a show first and I saw the Dudleys and I saw them in action before they went to WWF or WWE. And I saw how they really made the crowd like, I mean, they almost caused a riot, you know what I mean? And I was mm. like, yo, what is this shit? And then I saw how the Sandman would come in and, you know, Rob Van Dam. And I was like, yo, these, this shit is live. But I didn't know who these people were. Mm. You know, I didn't know who New Jack were or whatever. I should have known who Jack Victory was because he was in WCW. Some of those guys, Rob Van Dam was in WCW. Hack, Sandman was in WCW. But I didn't really, it didn't really dawn on me. Mm. And my first, my first match, we did a practice. We did a practice. Because you can, when they put the ring up, you can practice before the show starts. Yeah. So I was practicing, and they let me get they, – they, Tommy Dreamer and them guys allowed me to get in the ring. They wanted to see what I had or whatever because CW them brought me in. And then after practice, right before the doors open up, Tommy Dreamer goes, hey, I want you to wrestle Julio De Niro at the time. And I said, yeah, cool. So – but I didn't know that there were some guys that wanted to get off the ring crew, like the, the Baldies, like Angel, Tony DeVito – um, some of those guys, they wanted Billy Wilds, they wanted to get off the ring crew. And so they needed someone else to mm. fill in. And so I did a match at the Roadhouse in Virginia against Julio De Niro. And he carried me the whole match, thank God. <laughs> and so <laughs> after that, after that, um, Tommy said, you can wrestle with us and you can also help put up the ring. So I was, I was doing two jobs, wrestling and putting up the ring. And that's how I got in. But the, the locker room, man, you know, from day one was awesome. Even when I wasn't wrestling, just hanging out with with, with CW and uh, and Steve Carino at the ECW shows, mm. they were man, they they were like family. You know, and then when I really got in there, when I got in on the roster, yo, know, it was like cousins, brothers, more like brothers and sisters. You know what I mean? So yeah, it was. That's how tight it was. I have never been in a locker room since then that was that tight. That was the tightest locker room that I probably would probably ever been in. You know, even when I was in OVW, it wasn't like that. So, you know, that's how ECW was. No, it's good. You do hear from a lot of wrestlers that were there that it was like a family in a way, like one big family, uh, a messy family, but uh, a family. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Like <laughs> but that's what that's, that's what I mean. That's that's pretty much how families are, right? You know what Absolutely. I mean? What family? What family? Pretty much. <laughs> It is all together, you know what I mean? If they are, they bullshit. So 100%. it's like the, 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 the more messy your family is, pretty much the better, especially in the black community, you know what I mean? So that's how ECW was, man. It was like going to a barbecue, man. And it's like, you got your uncles over here, <laughs> you know, your Sandman's, New Jack, Balls, Mahone. Man, it was just, yo, know, I loved it. Just the way, just the way you loved it. You're talking about now, you've got a smile on your face, like a genuine smile. And I love it, man. Because I, <laughs> I, um, I, yeah. I literally would have to get the VHSs uh, from the shops of ECW, and we didn't get it in the UK mm. until like 2000. It was on like a mm. Bravo, I think it was like a Channel Bravo. So, and then that, I, I, I think that's why genuinely, like, I remember you, I remember Balls, RVD. RVD was one of my favorites as a kid, and where some people really went mental. But um, I want to yeah. know also, who did you find yourself hanging out with the most in ECW? Sort of traveling with, backstage with, going. Oh, it was it was the it, yeah, it was the Rain Crew guys. You know what I mean? Um, your your you guys like uh, Tony Marquez, Tommy Marquez, uh, the the prodigy, Keener, who I hung out with pretty much. But 
But then once we got to the arena and everything, once we got to the arena and everything, I mean, you hang out with everyone. Hmm. But because we on the ring crew, we are there first. And we drive yeah. and we, you know, we get there first to put up the ring. So, you know, once you're on the ring crew, that's it. You, you hanging out. You, you're pretty much hanging out with those guys. You know, and, and everyone had their own cliques pretty much. Yeah. But even though they had their own cliques, we still were family. You know what I mean? Because you had, you had, your, you had your guys over here who smoked the weed. You know, your RBD guys, you know, they were straight weed. You know, it, may, it might be RBD and it might be Kit Cash or whoever, I don't know. But mm. then over here on the other on, on the other click, you had your hard hitting drug guys, you know, your, your <laughs> Sandman, your balls, your new jack, you know, those guys was was hitting it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then you had and, and then you had your then you had your guys who didn't do anything, but they were just watching, they were just like you know, your C.W. Andersons, your, 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 your Simon Diamonds, your Johnny Swingers. And then you had us, the ring crew guys who just put up the ring and be like just watching everybody. <laughs> you know, so we had, we had our own cliques. Yeah. But we came together, you know what I mean? Especially at that time, we weren't getting paid. At, at, at a time, um, I think uh, Paul, Paul was going back and forth with WWE. And he was kind of like misleading certain, some things or whatever. I don't know. But we were, a lot of guys weren't getting paid. I was getting paid because I was on a ring crew because I was getting cash, you know. Mm. So, but the guys that was on contract, they weren't getting paid. And so you had a lot of animosity going on, a lot of, the morale was like really low, but mm. you know, you, you wouldn't have known it when you went to a show. It was just us. We knew it as a family. You know, we didn't air our differences, but there's a lot of guys that were pissed off. This, but you know, that's what it was. You know. Yeah, no, I can imagine, man. I mean, yeah, it's not nice, obviously, doing job and not getting paid for it. Um, I'd like to know <laughs> who came up with the idea to pair you and Balls Mahoney as a tag team, because like it was such. A, I thought it was an odd pair, but it worked. You know, it was it was very entertaining. <laughs> like I don't know, just I don't know. Uh, you know, <laughs> that, I have no idea, man. I don't know. I think, I think at one time, Paul wanted to push. He was trying to push me. I think at one time, it either it either was Paul's idea or Tommy's idea or both. I'm not sure. Mm. Um, but they were trying to push me, I guess, because I was going up against Rhino a lot. Sometimes, you know, um, and then I heard at one point, you know, when when Rhino had the television championship, that I was I was being looked at to go up against him. I don't think it, it never, you know, I don't, it, it, it never came true. But he would put, Paul would put me up, he would put me with the Sandman, New Jack once, once or twice, even Raven one time. And then uh, it came to Balls. And he just stuck with me and Balls for some reason. He just stuck, you know. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I was in the ring, I was tagging with, um, I'm not going to say tag. It was more like they came in and um, I don't know the word for it. It was just like uh, they made an entrance, like Sandman, New Jack, or whatever. Uh, but I tagged with Balls. I know for sure, you know, me and Balls were only the tag team partners. But when when I was in the ring with, with, with Sandman, New Jack, Raven, it was more like they came in and they saved me or something like that. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but but I don't know. I don't know who who came up with that idea, but it just stuck. You know what I mean? If you watched, uh, we had uh, I don't know if it's November to remember in Chicago, but anyway, we wrestled in Chicago and we did a flaming table match with the mm. Baldies, and all of them were wearing t-shirts. You know, I didn't wear a t-shirt. You know, what I mean, I wanted to look like a wrestler, so I worked out. I'm not saying they didn't work out. I just, <laughs> I just, that's, that was my thing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. I remember, I, I remember, I remember in the back we calling a match, and I'm thinking that I'm gonna go through the table because I'm the young buck, you know. What I mean, I'm the green, I'm the green horn, and they looking at me. And Angel goes, "No, dumbass, you're not going through the table. You're the only one that that's not wearing a t-shirt, and you all, you got all that chicken grease on you. How are you gonna go through the table?" And I was like a deer <laughs> in the headlight. I was like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> I was, I was like, oh yeah. He said, no, he said, no, man, I'm going to the table. I said, okay, all right, cool. You know, I didn't know. 
I had yeah. never been in a, a tables match at all. I didn't know what it was. Um, I think I've seen the Dudleys do it once. And I was just like, yo, I'm going to a fucking table on fire and shit, you know? And they were like, oh, no, you're not going to no table, bro. You don't have no T-shirt on. I was like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> uh, I do remember that match. So bro, it was like, not a chance. I, I think it sort of added to it that you was the only one that didn't have a top on, so... I mean, obviously, you knew you're not going for a table, but yeah. there was that there was that element of surprise that like, this could actually happen because it's ECW. You just never know. But um, thank God right. you didn't. Right. Um, you've actually because you just mentioned them as well. Um, <laughs> I was fascinated with them as a stable as well. The Baldies, um, just only in ECW, right? You get a faction mm. called the Baldies. But um, I just want to know. Obviously, you did the right. famous tables match with them. You actually had quite a fun rivalry with them. What would they like to work with? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was good, man. Angel and uh, DeVito, man. And, you know, and before that, I didn't know DeVito had uh, actually worked a lot in WWF at the time, you know. He did a lot of work in, in uh, and so, uh, you know, they took care of us, you know. Well, they took care of me, you know what I mean? So, um, and if that's the thing with me, I had size. I had a good size with me, you know, everything. Uh, and so, uh, we just had good matches, you know, with brawling. And so, I was just... I was just along for the ride, man. I didn't, mm. I didn't know a lot. I was very green. I was like two, th about three years into the business. And I was like, wow, this has happened. I'm on pay-per-view, you know, three years in the business. And here I am. So I, I, you know, everything was, everything was like a blur and new to me mm. now looking back, you know what I mean? Um, and so um, I'm just glad that I was with guys who took care of me. No, that's cool, man. I mean, I know it's sort of blur and you're only there for a short period of time but I still remember I, I think just because you had such a unique look especially in ECW you know it's not many people are known for sort of being in the best shape but you were so I just remember in ECW but I want to know did you have many interactions with Paul Heyman um not many not many because like I said he was he was up here so yeah um but the times that I did the times that I did were you know he he was he was coaching man you know he was trying to you know if he was directing a video or something like that, um, you know, he was like that, you know. And I, like I said before, uh, I think that's another reason why they were trying to, they were thinking about pushing. Because like, like I said, I was I was one who didn't wear a T-shirt, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look back, actually, if you look back, not, hardly not, well, really, no one, everyone wore singlets or t shirt pretty much. Yeah, pretty much everyone wore. It. Yeah, if I'm thinking about it now, uh, maybe maybe Easy Money. Um, he didn't wear a shirt. Kid Cash didn't. Kid Cash. Uh, Kid Cash didn't wear one. Little Guido. Uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm actually Guido. Thinking. Yeah, Little Guido. Uh, probably, yeah, you could probably name about five guys if that. <laughs> Jerry. Yeah, exactly. But but for me, I didn't wear. You know, I didn't wear like long pants. It mm -hmm. was just trunks, trunks, and that was it. And I wanted to be because I want my favorite wrestler was Ric Flair, so. I used to wear my knee pad below my shin. Oh, so I'm sorry, below my it. knees. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's me. That was that was my thing, you know. I wanted to be like Ric Flair. But then the chain with the lock on it, uh, that came from Naughty by Nature. Okay. In, in, uh, because I grew, I grew up in East Orange, New Jersey. Mm. One of my mates is going to love to hear that. I part. grew up in East Orange. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in East Orange, New Jersey. And Tretz, Tretz, Vinny, I forget the name, uh, Kenny G, uh, Ken G, them guys went to East Orange High School when I went to East Orange High School. Mm. And so uh, I just remember him coming out with the chain with a lock on it. And I said, oh, I'm going to do that. And I said, you know, this is down for, this is like for my brothers on, on lockdown, you know what I mean? Who in jail and whatever, you know what I mean? So that was my thing. And then the hat, the hat came. I just wanted to put something on, you know, like the Godfather or something like that. Yeah, I just like the hat. But, yeah, the, the, that was one of the things. And, and um, so Paul, he would talk to me every once in a while, you know what I mean? But not – we didn't have – like, because, like I say, he was back and forth going to do business with WWE or whatever or whatever he was doing. So, yeah, you know, it was all good. <laughs> I get you, man. That's, that's awesome.
gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it's time for What Do You Call It Podcast! Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of What Do You Call It Podcast. This is actually part two of my interview with everybody's favourite homeboy, Chili Willy. Um, unfortunately, Ooh. the interview cut off before because of unforeseen circumstances due to the rain. It's a bit shit. But he's nice enough to come back in part two <laughs> and to finish this interview off because we're having such a good chat. Anyway, what we were talking about before the rain ruined it, it was, that's actually unfortunate, it was the, we recently lost New Jack. Uh, I wanted to ask you, if you had any fun new Jack stories that you can share on this podcast. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. Apologize. Well, I can't apologize. This is the Philippine weather. Not your uh, fault, man. Season not your here. fault. <laughs> <laughs> rainy, yeah, rainy season here. We were talking and all of a sudden it just went black. So, but anyway, I'm glad to be back. Um, not just here on your podcast, but even on my own podcast and other podcasts. But yeah, getting... Getting back into the story with New Jack, man, uh, God rest his soul and, and all the others. Uh, yeah, my, my only one really fun, well, not fun, but it was just it was just hilarious, I guess, uh, story was uh, coming from the ECW arena in Philadelphia. And New Jack had just bought a, a Mitsubishi Eclipse. Mm -hmm. And he had a girlfriend up in Ohio. So that's probably, I don't know how many hours, a couple of hours. But he wanted me to drive for him, I think, because his leg was messed up. He was on some painkillers and all other kind of shit. So, <laughs> so I'm driving for him. So we stop. And we stop at a restaurant, dude. And he's all jacked up. I and mean, when we say jacked up, I mean, he's, like, coked up or whatever on drugs or whatever. And, uh, but when we walk in, he's, he's fine. He's doing, he's doing great. It's when he sat down and uh, we get to order the food. It's probably, like, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And... The lady brings back the food, and I'm ready to dig in. And I'm looking over. I just happen to look up at, at New Jack. He has a fork in his hand, and he's like this, and he got slob coming out of his mouth <laughs> like this. And so he's just he's standing. He's just sitting there like this for like 30, 30 seconds, 20 <laughs> seconds. I'm like, yo, Jack, wake up. We got to eat, man. We got to eat. Everyone's looking at him and everything. The lady comes back by. She asks me. Is he okay? I said, yeah, he just throws some painkillers, you know what I mean? And uh, so it, was, it took me, the lady, <laughs> one other guy to get him back into the Mitsubishi because they're so they're so low Yeah. Uh, to grab the ground. And, uh, man, that trip right there was like um, – because I never really hung out with Lou Jack. I never really hung out. I, I just hung out with guys on the ring crew. And yeah. so for me, it was like, whoa, you know, I'm hanging out with Lou Jack. He want me to drive for but he was so he was so he was so messed up, man, that <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't even eat. And I I was scared to death. And I was like, where do we go? You know, how do I get there? Whatever. He, you know, just, just, just drive, man. But he was also he would go in and out, you know what I mean? And mm. that's just how he was. And uh, but uh, you know, he got us there and everything and took care of me for a good week, man. And <laughs> made it one piece. You know, we had a good time, man. I had a good time with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, nah, sweet man, sweet. So, I would have asked because, um, unfortunately, ECW would close. And in part one, we discussed your ECW career in a bit of detail. I want to ask because you actually had a few matches for WWE after ECW went out of business. I just want to know what was the experience like for you to work in WWE? Um, there were dark matches. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I keep forgetting about the delay, I keep forgetting about the delay. That's right. There was dark matches, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And so um, it was. Uh, it was interesting, you know. Um, you know, ECW was like a elevated indie show. You know, um, mm. you go in, we set up the ring. That was it, you know. And then the guy Randy, he was set up to his music, his music video, and everything. So, and but when I got to um, WWE, just the production of it, man, was like it was like a Broadway show almost. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean to walk in. And see them guys hanging up the lights, and the ring was already set up. It was a stage, and so and you look around. There's like twenty thousand seats, 
the first thing you do is you go into the catering. That's that's where everyone meets. That's where all the deals are made. I think a lot of times um, a lot of things happen in the catering. So um, you go in there and you meet guys, you meet your star, you see the stars or whatever. Mm-hmm. But uh, and then and then someone will come to you. Someone will come to you. I think at that time it was Kevin Kelly came to me and said, "Okay, Chili, you know you're gonna wrestle such and such." And you get in there, and uh, luckily it was a, a local a local indie guy. His name was Pat Cusick, and so you know I had wrestled him on the on the North Carolina circuit, and so it wasn't bad at all. You know uh, mm. they actually let me they they actually let me go over on on those matches. Um, a lot of times when you do dark matches, you don't go over. You know a lot of times you are the one who are you you're the jobber. Mm. And so um, not that it really means anything because we know wrestling. You know what I mean? Everyone's a winner, but <laughs> uh, uh, you know it was just that. They have a way of looking at you, and they have yeah. a way of looking at the other guy. Also, just because you went over doesn't mean that you make you're going to get a contract. Although I got a contract, but so that I think he he I think I don't know if Cusick got one anyway. But yeah, so it was uh, it was just an experience, man. It was really um, you know from from the time you go to the arena, put your bags in the locker in the dressing room. You don't have the dressing room with the stars. Mm. You know, you you see, you see signs. You walk in, you see Vince McMahon, Stephanie McMahon, Triple H. And then over here, you see major talent, and then you see uh, like local talent here. And then you know, so 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 you know where you put your bags at. You don't put your bags in there with the rock. Did you know where to put your bag in with like Stephanie McMahon or something? <laughs> <laughs> You better not. You better not. <laughs> Who the hell are you? You know what I mean? And so yeah. you go in and you have to be dressed nicely. Mm-hmm. You walk in. It's not a thing where you walk in there with T-shirt. You want to have a, a tie. You know, you want to have on a, 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 a jacket. You know, if you really, you know, first impressions, man. You know what I mean? And so you walk in, you put your bags down, and you go straight to the catering, man. And and, and you go and you introduce yourself, you know. So yeah. you don't I was going to say – um because obviously you hear about these stories when local talent, they have to shake everyone's hand. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? You better, you better introduce yourself to just about everyone. I don't care if the guy says he's the cleaning guy from the from the arena. <laughs> mm. If he looks like a wrestler, you better introduce yourself. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's better yeah. safe than sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's better safe than sorry, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But, but, but the thing is, you don't, once you go in, you get your food, you introduce yourself, and you sit down and start eating. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't necessarily get up and stop your eating and say, oh, hi, my name is such No. You, I mean, you eat, of course. After you're done eating or whatever, if someone's approachable, then you might want to go say hello. Or yeah. if, they, you know, if, they're not, if they're not eating themselves or whatever. Um, you don't want to interrupt someone if they're on the phone. You know what I mean? So... You, 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 you're, you're Kofi Kingston. I, I come in and you're on the phone. I don't want to say, hi, hi, Kofi Kingston, I'm William Jones. How are you? No. Yeah. Late. <laughs> Let him, you know, do his thing, you know what I mean? So after the catering, what you do is you go back to the dressing room, mm-hmm. take off your clothes, you have your warm-up, your, war- your workout clothes. And then you go into the arena and you just hang around and, you know, just start warming up. And you don't get in the ring unless – Pretty much unless someone tells you or, you know, um, it's okay to get it because you don't know if you just don't want to get in there and mess it up. You have dirty shoes on or mm. <laughs> and that's the show. And Matt, you know, the canvas and here you are. They just they just swept it and you go in there and some nobody and you go to leave footprints. They're going to be mad as hell. So you mm. wait. You just wait outside. Yeah. You wait outside someone like John Laurinaitis or whoever's in charge. I'll come in and say, hey, you know, hey, Chelly, how you doing? You know, you want to – then he'll say, get in the ring or at work, whatever. You know what I mean? So that's it's, – it's a process, you know what I mean? And you just, you just got to shut your mouth. And no matter how many times you go up there, how many, no matter how many times they say, hey, we're going to bring you up, you, you got to go through that whole – that same process just like that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and then until you start, you know, really – if they give you a contract and all that good stuff, then, you know, something different. But – just being a regular talent, mm. yeah, you got to know your role. <laughs> the Rock said, "You got to know your role." Know your role, Ash. Your role. <laughs> Shut your mouth. Yeah. No, exactly. that's. <laughs> it sounds like an experience, but you, a lot of it sounds like common sense as well. To be honest, but yeah, you got to experience yeah. it. 
yes. in the big, yeah, in the biggest boom period of wrestling history. So you know that's awesome, mm-hmm. man. Yeah, and you would actually yeah. sign a developmental contract with WWE um, in two thousand four, right? Five. Um, yeah. I just want to know. This is when you returned from the army, um, which you know I, I, I perhaps it respect you for that. By the way, that's I think you are the first guest I've had uh, that has you know been yeah. in the army. So. You know, wow. um, bless you Thank for that, you. man. <laughs> so, I actually just want to ask if, if it's okay, just to briefly talk about it. Mm-hmm. I have to ask because it was after your ECW run, and then you did a few dark matches. But I think the listeners will want to you know, briefly hear um, because you actually earned a purple heart and a bronze star. I'm not going to try and pretend like yes. I'm an army guy. Like I haven't been to the gym in many years, um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but I'm, I have respect, you know, um, for some, I've had family members, but um, he was actually wounded in special missions, mm-hmm. weren't you? I mean, how scary was that for you, mate? If you don't mind me asking. Oh ah, yeah, man, it was, um, I can talk about, yeah, I can talk about it now. You know, uh, when I got back from the war and I went to OVW, I remember break down and crying when I when Stephanie McMahon asked me that question, that was that was then. But now you know it's um it's one of those things you know we went over we went over to Iraq as a company, mm-hmm. not a battalion. You know, companies is probably about you know uh, 130, 130 guys or something like that. Where a battalion is like I don't know a lot more. And so mm-hmm. we went over for a special mission. Uh, we were just like the bitch boys for the for the for the special ops guys. Uh, we were not special forces. Um, but we we were embedded with the special forces. So they took our name tags off. They took everything off. They let us grow a beard. They let us, you know, so we looked like them. Mm-hmm. But we were just basically, when those guys went to sleep, we were the guys pulling guard for them. Mm-hmm. Um, when we when we went to sleep, they were pulling guard and doing their thing. Mm-hmm. We ride out with them. We do everything they they wanted us to do for them except certain things, you know. Yeah, because it was special. They had this, this special shit. So we were be we we were be uh, engaged in a lot of fighting, a lot of nights, you know. And so uh, I moved around from different safe houses to safe houses until I got into the one safe house, which was in Samar, Iraq. And it was uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie, not Thirteen Soldiers, but it was like uh, the movie something like where. Benghazi or something like that or anyway where those guys fought on the roof and there was a cemetery there mm. um think of the name but anyway that's we were set up like that we were about 11 clicks inside a rack uh behind the wire meaning that we were probably about eight or nine miles away from any other American forces we were really deep inside so we were like mm. in the heart of the city and all the all the uh, insurgents guys they knew what house we were in the whole nine. So we had to fortify it and everything and build it up. And so anyway, one day, we, well, we kept, it was during Ramadan. We kept getting bombed every, every night because after Ramadan, you know, you, they, they uh, the thing is they eat, though they fast all day, then they, they eat around five or 30, I think something like that at night. And then they mm-hmm. want to go out and fight. So we would get hit every night for about 30 days, about, about a good month and a half. We would we would get hit every night, fighting every night. You know, RPGs, small rockets, uh, mortar rounds, everything. So on a particular day, November twenty second, two thousand and three, mm-hmm. never forget it. We we needed more security, as far as like sandbags or whatever, Jersey barriers, and so we had a group come in from a National Guard group from Louisiana come in, engineers, and they mm-hmm. were building up our perimeter. Well, we had to put, we had to go outside and, and pull security for them. As we were pulling security for those guys, the the terrorist guys, they knew it. I'm not gonna call them terrorists. The people, the Iraqi guys, knew it, mm. and so they they started they started lobbing uh, mortar around at, at us because we were outside. And uh, long as we were inside, we could we could fend them off or whatever. But we we're outside exposed. And one came a, as they were coming in. No, as the, as the mortar rounds are coming in, we're running to try to get inside. Mm. What we should have done was stay right there, dug in, and let let the mortar rounds keep going over. Well, as we were running, they they are clocking it, and so when you're running, it, it's getting further to you. You just need to stay right there. Hopefully, it don't hit you. But it hit in between me and a friend of mine, 
mm-hmm. he caught what he caught shrapnel in his throat, and then I caught some shrapnel on my backside and shit like that. So he didn't die, but you know, um, okay, we were both so injured. I, yeah. yeah, we were, we were both injured. Yeah, and uh, but he didn't he didn't come back. He didn't come back to Iraq. I came back maybe two weeks later. No, I was in Balad. Yeah, I came back maybe three weeks later or something like that. But just on that note, the WWE came to Iraq the first time. Their, mm-hmm. their first USO trip, when they came to Iraq, they came to see me. Specifically because of because of Rhino. Rhino, Rhino was with WWE at the time. Yeah. And so he asked, I guess, Vince Man or whoever's in charge, where was Chili Willie at? And... They wanted he wanted to come see because they they knew that I, that I, that I had gotten hurt. But I had went home. I went home to America because I, at that time I was married, so I didn't stick around for WWE to come. But it was him, you know, the whole gang. Sable at the time she was there, uh, Stone Cold, Big Show, whoever was on that show, that first USO show. Yeah, they came to my unit. They came to my unit specifically just to see me. But I wasn't there. But they saw the they saw the rest of my friends and everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's mental, mate. Honestly, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, I, that's I, the first show. just wanted to allow you to sort of tell the story and sp- then tell me that as well. You know, I think I did ask before we recorded part two, uh, part one. If it's right for me to ask about the walk, because yeah, oh yeah, it's just, okay. Uh, yeah. Just out of respect, mate. But so thank you for telling me that, and I think the yes. listeners as well will respect that. Um, <laughs> to sort of uh, wrap up this uh, part two interview. <clears throat> Uh, I just want to ask, because you have mentioned them already, and we did discuss it briefly, is about you doing a few dark matches for WWE. You would actually get a, a developmental contract, um, as we just mentioned before the war, but you'd come back. I basically want to know, how was OVW like for you? And was this was this when it was run by Jim Cornette, by the way? I got, um, when I got hurt, whatever, right before I got out of the military in 2004, mm-hmm. Uh, you know they were they were running that gimmick with Muhammad Hassan. They were running, uh, they were doing Vardy, Muhammad Hassan. They yeah. were doing a gimmick. Uh, well, Paul got, Paul Heyman got me in. They, I guess they wanted me to be like another uh, GI bro or something like that. They wanted me to be like the new <laughs> the new GI bro. So yeah. I got out of the military. I got out of the military two months early mm. because of the contract signing. And so when I went there, when I went there. Um, at that time, Bill DeMont was doing the training, mm-hmm. and then and then uh, something happened. He he got let go, and I want to say Tommy Dreamer and Lance Storm came in. Mm. Um, but but Jim Cornette was there. But like every you, we would go wrestle every week. I think once a week on a Wednesday or Tuesday or something like that. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in Louisville, Kentucky, but Jim Cornette did the class of critiquing the the show after. So he would do the he would do the critiquing of your matches, what you did uh, the night before, and then Rip Rogers was the the he was just the head of the, the undercard class. You you had guys like JTG there. I can't forget the other ones, but. On my class, it was me, like guys like me, Johnny Morrison, Bobby Lashley, Ken Anderson, Beth Phoenix, Julian Hall, the Pope. Good the fucking Boogie class. Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even, even rest his soul, uh, Matt Capitelli, um, he was there. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a hell of a, it was a hell of a class, and all those, all those people, man, they made it. You know, Dolph Ziggler. You know, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a good class. Yeah. No, that's yeah. good, man. That was good. Um, sadly, were unexpectedly released in 2005. Um, but I want to ask, you're a trainer in the Philippines at the moment, aren't you? Are you yes. not being trained? So you are. That's pretty cool. Yes, I, wanna... I was. Yes, oh, I you was. was. Yeah. I want to ask, um, is there any major differences between the, the wrestling styles in the Philippines and in America? Yes. Oh, man. Here, in the, they, they had wrestling here back in the 90s uh, from what, you know, when I got here. I didn't know that. Mm. Early 90s, they had a wrestling but the guys weren't trained. They were not trained at all. They just kind of learned it on the fly. So if you watch their if you watch their videos, you will see. Oh my God! Look at you know the bumps, the flips, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But they were on television. Fast forward to 2014, 15 when I got here, I went to a show. The first show that I went to it was at a uh, it's like a mall arena called MCS. 
Now, let me tell you something, man. When coming from America, coming from an indie show where you have, if you have 100 people in, a, in an indie show in America, you're doing good. Mm. Most of the time, you got 25, 30 people. I went to this show in, in the Philippines, here in the Philippines, and it was ran by PWR. And, and that group is still, they still around. And I told, I'm telling you, man, they had about 600 people, 600 people at this show. And I said to myself, I said, oh, my God, what's going on here in the Philippines? I thought, you know, I was like, what, what? They do wrestling like this? Yeah. You know, because I had to research online to, to find out they had uh, wrestling. And they had the media there and everything. I said, oh, my God. But then when they wrestled, when they came out to wrestle, because they didn't, none of them had no form of training, wrestling standards were low. Yeah. Right? They needed help. They needed help bad. And so they they really – um. I kind of helped consult a little bit with different ones in, in wrestling or whatever. And then they brought in some other guys that, that would come in. To Jerry, he would come per periodically. But still, even now today, they're still learning. They mm -hmm. are um, – they're still uh, – it's a learning process for them. They – some of them grasp it, you know, but and then some of them don't. You know what I mean? It's just – they have to really um, – I don't know. It's – they fake it in a way. You know what I mean? They play yeah. it. They yeah, actually yeah. play wrestling. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we really – because they're not really – they're not accustomed to the strikes like we are in the actual move and the intensity they mm. lack. But they're learning. They're learning very fast because there are a lot of uh, international people starting to come over. And just before we had the um, – before we had this pandemic, it was, it was talk that Rakishi and his uh, son's promotion – their promotion out of uh, California, they were coming to the Philippines. But, you know, the pandemic happened, so mm. it stopped. You know what I mean? So, and I, and I told the guys here, I said, you guys better be ready for them Samoans because they don't play. <laughs> they, yeah, man. They don't play at all, you know what I mean? Don't so you, with the Samoans. You know, when you hit them, you better be ready. Yeah, you better be ready. You better be ready. Yeah, you man. Know? But they're learning. They're learning. You know, you like TJP, came, he came here. Jeff Cobb came here. Like I said, the jury came here. Um, then you have some guys from WUW, uh, World Underground Wrestling, uh, Ron, Ron Hess or something like that. I don't know those people, but they they also came here. So mm. it, it's picking up. It's just that the pandemic stopped everything. Yeah, man. But it's, it's... definitely a different style. No, that's that's cool because I, I wanted to double check. I'm, I'm not really familiar with it, but I wanted to ask because I know like with yeah, no. Japan strong style and in Britain in the UK where I'm from, yeah, you know, it's very technical. Philippine, the Philippines don't have a style. Yeah, yeah, they don't really have a style yet. They're they're still they're like babies. They're they're still developing their style. No, that's wicked, man. That's pretty cool. Hopefully, you do get Rikishi mm -hmm. and uh, the Samoans over when this all calms down. I can hope so soon because I'm done with it already. But uh, <laughs> but so. Um, well, hey, Buka, man, it will, it will, it will. You yeah. know, I just, I just got off a podcast with one of the Philippine wrestlers, and I, and I told him, I said, I heard something, you know, a while back. You know, just this pandemic thing, we have the world has to start learning that we have to live with it. You know, yeah. it's like AIDS, it's like AIDS, it's like yeah. cancer, it's like the flu. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like the common cold. No matter, no matter you take the vaccine, no matter you don't take the vaccine. Mm. We got to live with it now. This thing is here, man. You know, I don't, I don't like it. No one likes it. You know no. what I mean? Whether it's, you know, man-made or whatever, we you stuck do. with it. You know you, I mean? I, You're spot on. I absolutely agree. And I'm not just saying it for the sake of it. <laughs> I genuinely agree. We, it's not, it's, I don't think we should ignore it, but I think we need to learn to live with it. No. It's there. It's not going anywhere right. you, anytime soon. But we now have the vaccine. We have now, you know, better research and resources for it. So... But um, that's a bit of a downer. Yeah. Let's end the let's end this part two episode <laughs> on an up part because I've really enjoyed talking to yes. you. And um, you know, so we get on quite well now. And obviously, we're talking with the DMs as well, which is awesome. So to wrap this interview up officially, I know it's a bit of a boring question, but I, I like to ask the, the my guests what's been your favorite match of your career? Of my career, my favorite match mm -hmm. probably. Probably the most memorable, it was the one with the tag, uh, Balls Mahoney against the Baldies. Oh, the uh, Flaming Table. The flaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've never done, <laughs> I've never done something like that before. Yeah. Um, not too many, <laughs> not too many people get in a match like that. So, um, 
Yeah, that was probably one of my favorite and more memorable matches. Nah, that's awesome, man. If you want to hear um, <laughs> about that match in particular in more detail, which includes uh, Chili Wheelie thinking that he was actually going to be set on fire without a top on, <laughs> please go back and listen to part one because it's quite funny. Ooh. And uh, <laughs> nah, it's been a, it's been a blast talking to you, mate. Uh, where can fans Thank find you, you on social media? Uh, uh, just Facebook, you know, Chili Willy ECW, um, Instagram. I'm not really on Instagram that much uh, or mm. Twitter that much. Uh, but all of it's Chili Willy ECW, tw- Chili Willy 2469. So uh, just look up Chili Willy and you'll, you'll find. Look up Chili Willy Wrestler and you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll find. Yeah. You just look up Chili <laughs> Willy. <laughs> you find the penguin. I was going to say that. Brackets, wrestler. Because otherwise, <laughs> why is he interviewing the car in character? Like, no, no. no. <laughs> ECW original, people. No doubt. But, um, Thank you, bro. There's a reason why he's everybody's favorite homeboy because he is no a legend and a great guy. <laughs> Thank you for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure you, talking Booker. to you. For everyone yes, that has listened sure. to this you episode, too. there's going to be more episodes of What Do You Call It podcast coming out soon. But for now, here is a word from my sponsors. Take care. I have a special announcement for my next guest. Hello, everyone. This is everyone's favorite homeboy, ECW original Chili Willy. You are watching What Do You Call It? Podcast. Yeah.